And the scary thing for me tonight is, you know, lifelong learning is what we talk about wanting for our students. And this is the first time I'm having something record me and um, not being one who spends a lot of time on selfies and recording myself. I'm feeling quite intimidated by that machine, not by you at all, and I'm hoping to forget it's there. So thank you very much for coming out this evening. Um, the intention tonight is for me to get to know you a little bit, for you to get to know me a little bit. And as we're starting to think about what we want to put in place for 2018, it was important to us that we have a conversation with you about some of those plans. Um, I feel almost like we made a mistake, shall I say. Uh, Sue Ellen and I decided that we would like to restructure PC classes and we kind of did it because it was so important to us and we know that um, it did rock the boat, let's say, of a number of our families and we should really have talked to you first, so I'm sorry. And they should say, that they tell us the first rule of public speaking is not to apologise before you begin. So I didn't. All right. So a little bit about me. Um, you can tell from my accent, not Australian born, born in South Africa, but I've lived in Australia 21 years. And I've taught in all kinds of schools. My first school was a large public school in South Africa. And I also then moved into private education. And most of the schools I taught in after that, a couple of them there were, were, dare I say, elite private schools, girls' schools, boys' schools, co-ed schools. If you're familiar with South Africa, Rosebank, Johannesburg, Ravonia, so you know the kinds of kids I'm talking about and the kinds of SES or socioeconomic background these young people would have had. And then I came to Perth and my first teaching post was at um, St Hilda's Perth. So a very similar environment and that made it relatively easy for me to transfer into Australian culture amidst a school culture that I understood pretty well. And then I had the opportunity to move into Christian education and I, I really have enjoyed that and I've been for the last 19 years pretty much in Christian education apart from last year where I had the opportunity to work for a year at Wesley College, Perth. So boys' school back into the elite. And, and the reason I'm mentioning the wide variety of those schools is that what I have noticed is the conversation is the same. What we want for our young people is a good start in life. We want to set our kids up for the future. We want to set our kids up so that they can live happy, fulfilled lives. So it's no different, the conversation, no matter which school you happen to be in. I thought I would like to tell you a little bit about why it is I'm still teaching considering that I started in 1980. I've been at this for 37 years, and you may be wondering, when is she going to retire? When is she going to stop this? And the short answer is, uh, never. I really want to do this for as long as I can. Because of her. This is my granddaughter. She's Morgan. And this was taken when she was just under three. I know there's a stove there and I know we're cooking. But it is a 21st century kitchen. It's an induction cooker. So it's cold everywhere except under the pot. And she knows this. And over the last couple of years, while she's been, or months, as she has started to learn to cook alongside us, and we've got her up to the stove because she stands on the chair and likes to stir things, she's learned how to stir without splashing stuff. And what interests me is the people who burn themselves are the adults. And only the other night I saw someone do what I've done so often, take something out of the oven, forget it's just come out of the oven, and touch it. 20 minutes under cold water. That's us, not her. She's quite cluey. Um, this photograph is one with which you might identify more closely because this could be you. It could have been me, building blocks, and a child of almost four. This was taken quite recently, and even what she's wearing, that could have been me, that could have been my daughter. And that signals for me that there are some things that don't change about learning. It's still important that students can read, that they can spell, that they can add and subtract. 
none of that stuff that we value has disappeared. But the photograph I love most is this one. Ooh, here it is. It's not because of the Essendon thing. Um, when we came to Perth, you must understand, we did not know AFL at all. And her mother was nine years old, and she picks her team by colour. So she likes red and black, hence Essendon. And she, I don't think she's ever actually seen them play live. But she also likes Miami Heat, uh, basketball, American. And she's been, and she's seen them live. And she follows American ice hockey, so it's the Coyotes, because they're red and black. So that's the only reason for that, so I apologise for that. But what intrigues me about this photograph is this little girl is just over a year. And at that age, I was dressed in my first pastel, pale yellow colour. Prior to that, first year of life, dressed only in white. You may have had parents who did that to you, or maybe this is yet another generation I'm talking about. And Morgan didn't ever get dressed only in white. She was never dressed in pale pastel colours. She was dressed like this right from the start. And I was a little taken aback, but I know not to say anything. And I just enjoy it. The other thing about the photo that signals to me how much the world has changed. Not only can you dress a child in AFL replica, but she's got my iPhone, my old one, when it was the only one I had. And she's very happily looking at pictures. And that is a representation of her world. And that is why I do what I do every day, because I want great education to meet the needs of children like this. And she stands for every child that I see in the college every day. When I look at them, I see her. And this is why I get up in the morning, because I want great education that is going to meet the needs of this generation. And so I come to the Melbourne Declaration. The state recognised, our federal government recognised there was a national imperative that recognised that we needed to think about education in response to changes in the world. And so in 2008, the Melbourne Declaration, incredibly interesting document, came about and was released. There is a, a, a website you can pick it up on, have a look at it. When I read it, the thing that stood out for me was that quote, for every child an education worth having. Another thing that I remember from the document is that our government requires that we provide education for every child that helps them to lead productive and fulfilling lives. Productive, we're thinking economics. They're going to have to contribute to our nation's economy, so our children are human resources, yes. But I'm really sad, very happy that the world fulfilling is in there as well because that speaks to children's passions and it speaks to the idea that we're not just educating kids for jobs, we're educating young people for life. And I think that's a really significant factor that's being taken into consideration. So I wanted to talk for a moment about what makes an education worth having for each child. It's an education shaped for individual need. It's an education that takes into account the cognitive stage for each child and the emotional stage of each child. It takes into account who your child is. And on the left-hand side, you will see that what we have thought about as our strategic imperative is we want to unleash the potential of each child. We want to provide exceptional learning for each child. We want each child to have the experience of vibrant community so that as they move from this community, they become community builders in the future. And we want each child to know what it is to be an authentic disciple of Jesus Christ. So how are we going to do those things? Well, the federal government has provided us with the Australian Curriculum Document. And I'd like to just talk a little bit about that during the course of the evening. 
The document makes very clear that literacy and numeracy still remain at the centre of education, whatever else we do. It is important that children can read and write. It's important that they're numerate. And at Calvary, you may know that in the middle and senior school, mathematics is a compulsory learning area, and so is English. English is required by the Australian curriculum to be compulsory. Mathematics is not required to be compulsory all the way through to year 12, but there is a numeracy requirement for graduation, and we've chosen to make sure that that is covered through remaining in the mathematics learning area. But literacy is so much more than reading and writing. Students also need to be critically literate. They need to understand every text they come across, every book they read, every advert they see, every television show they see, every time they look at the news, it's shaping their thinking. And I want them to be aware of how that is happening. How are the messages we get from the texts that, that surround us shaping our society? When do we allow that and when do we fight back? This is critical literacy. Visual literacy is also important. A lot of the information that we take in and a lot of what we experience around the world is coming at us through images. And so we have specific intentional teaching of visual literacy. And I was talking to my daughter only two nights ago. One of them is training to be a teacher. And she made this interesting observation. She said to me, she's teaching film, image, and she's a gamer. And she said, Mum, I'm really concerned about the social skills of young people. I think they don't read social cues very well. The conversation came about because I said to her, I was so irritated. I went from Saturday, from the funeral we'd attended, to do my grocery shopping. And instead of checking myself out, I went through the till. And you can guess what I'm going to say. I got this cheerful, so how's your day been going? And I said, fine. Like that. And that was my body language. Do you have any special plans for the weekend? And I kind of wanted to say, do you not get it? I don't want to talk. At least not now. Usually I'm quite nice to them. I live alone, so I have conversations with checkout chicks. But this day I wasn't happy with that, what I felt was intrusion. And Kami and I were talking about this, and she said, Mum, she just didn't read the cues. Young people don't read the cues. And then we got into the visual literacy thing. And she said... She's noticed as she's teaching visual literacy, students struggle to identify expressions. Is this a lack of vocabulary? Or is this because they spend a lot of time gaming, perhaps, and looking at figures that don't have a lot of expression? I don't know, but it's a conversation, and it's a conversation I think teachers will have. And then we'll have to look at how we address that. So, little digression, but... Literacy, visual literacy, is really significant. Numeracy is far more than mathematics. I was really interested the other day to read a paper that reminded me that every time, as an English teacher, I'm helping students structure an argument, sequence an argument. There's the word, sequence. We're doing numeracy in the middle of an English classroom. And students need to have an understanding of how these things stretch into all of their learning. At Calvary, we have a particular emphasis on thinking. We've been doing some research into thinking, and you may be aware that a number of our teachers have worked with Harvard University through a course creating a culture of thinking, or creating cultures of thinking. What we know about thinking now is it's not some sort of haphazard, some kids do it and some kids don't, and gee, you get lucky when you're a teacher, sometimes because they get it, and sometimes they don't. What we know is that we can actually help students understand thinking strategies that they can use in different learning situations. And I found this fascinating because I've come to understand my own thinking better, which I hope is making me a more effective teacher, and our students are starting to get the benefit of metacognition, thinking about thinking, and knowing what kind of thinking they're using. And we know that this is going to be an imperative for the future. Culture and community building is what we are required to be competent at when we move into the world. And so here we're giving a lot of attention and time to how we do this. And in our community at the moment, you may be aware that we have teams of teachers working on building what at the moment we're calling social-emotional learning, because that's what it's always been called, but we're looking for a better name for that. 
so that we have opportunity to speak into children's experiences of life. The days when you're sad, the days when you're happy, how do you deal with that when your friend is not so nice to you? What is bullying and what is just someone was nasty today and it's going to be okay tomorrow? What's the difference between those two situations? And where does our resilience come from and how can we remain emotionally whole as we travel through life? Um, so we're building that kind of program to support the learning of, of our students. And all of this, of course, within a Christian framework. So we're really concerned about exceptional lifelong learning for all. If I can just return to my own family situation for a moment. I realized recently that my father is a lifelong learner. He's 87 years old, he's a scientist, and over his long career, he was always interested in reading the next thing that was coming out, the next developments in his field. Um, he ran a research and development laboratory, analytical chemistry was his game, and you can imagine the technology in that field. So I grew up in a world, in a home, where there was someone who was always learning and always excited about learning. I didn't know it was called lifelong learning, and I think that's where this desire to keep learning came from. So lifelong learning is really important to me and I was fortunate to grow up in an environment where it was provided and modelled for me. And this is what we need to have in the mindset of our students. They need to understand that learning doesn't end when you finish year 12. It certainly doesn't end when you finish university. It doesn't end when you stand at graduation and wave that piece of paper. So it's important that we equip students with learning skills and learning strategies, that they learn how to learn so that we can make ourselves redundant to the process. A couple of years ago, it was this time of the year, that I actually left a school I'd been in for 14 years, and I walked out on my year 12 class. At interview for that particular role, the interviews were in April, May, March, March, had to give, or had to give six weeks notice, I gave a full term, because I thought that was the right thing to do. When I was asked at interview, or well, if you were successful in being offered this position, what about your year 12s? From my perspective, by the time a year 12 student is in what's pretty much their last term with me, if they still need me, I have not done my job. The idea is to make myself redundant to the process of their learning. So the skills are all in place. I'm there still, available as one of many learning resources to them. That's the ideal. The students I was talking about that year went on to achieve great results, went on to university, and many of them are in postgrad study now, and some of them I'm still in touch with. They didn't really miss me, because they knew exactly what to do in their final preparations for exams. Someone else competent stepped into the role, um, but the idea really is that what we want to do is equip our students so that when they move into the world of work, they have initiative, they can take initiative, they know how to operate without being given specific instructions every two minutes of the day. If they step into a university environment and they find themselves one of three to four hundred, five hundred students in a lecture or online, they know how to learn, they know how to deal with that. And they also know how to access one-on-one -on -one and small group learning as and when they need it. That's what we want for our students, and that's what we're trying to embed in the way that we deal with their learning in age-appropriate ways over the years that they're with us. So, exceptional lifelong learning is important, but what's very important to us is that it's for all. And I'm wondering if you've looked at the two photographs, and you can tell me who's missing. On the left, the photograph was taken Tuesday of last week when Sue Ellen Massey was doing some professional learning with our teachers. So that's our teachers learning. On the right, we have some students learning. Who's missing? Well, I've got teachers who are learners. There are students who are learners, and yes, they can have teachers there or not, 
but who are the learners who are not in the picture? Who are the learners necessary in the Partnership for Education who are not reflected there? Hmm? You guys. I couldn't find a picture. I looked. And I, I, I found a few pictures of parents involved in the school as volunteers and helpers. And I'm thinking, mm, could use that as learning. I'd have to get hold of you and ask your permission to put the slide up. But this is what tonight is all about. Tonight is about me saying to you, we want to put our money where our mouths are. We want to say, be partners with us in learning. Come and talk to us about your, student, your, your children's learning. You were their first teachers. You were the ones who there, were there in the beginning. And now as they come into high school, more so than any other time, they need, and as they are in high school, they're starting to need specialist educators who have specialist knowledge but you still know them best. And so come and talk to us. And that's what tonight's about, is I want to talk with you about the planning we're doing for next year. So you have an opportunity to talk back to us about how you think that's going to work. So it's about em embarking on a partnership with you where we work together for learning that meets the needs of your children. So one of the things we've done, and I want to tell you some of the organisational stuff we've put in place that we hope is going to help us in 2018 achieve the objective of for every child an education worth, happy, worth having. So there are eight learning areas in the Australian curriculum and we have faculties, so our specialist, specialist teachers work out of their different faculties. Josh Wilson is the head of English and LOT. Josh has always been head of English and LOT, but he's also had responsibility for other areas in the past. Darren Bennett, he has a change, is moving into human and social sciences, and we may change the name of that. But Darren has been in the past head of business and technology. Within the Australian curriculum, business, and this is hard to say, civics and citizenship, try saying it fast, actually sit within humanities. Um, history and geography. And as you go through the school, you get to 11 and 12 and subjects like economics, courses like economics in 11 and 12 come out of that faculty. So does business management. So does politics and law. And so does history. So does geography. And what we've noticed in our college, and it's also apparent across the nation, Take up of history and geography is diminishing as students are realizing business is important and they're taking up business a lot more and economics and politics and law. These are subjects that weren't in schools when I started, um, at, when I was at school or when I started teaching. So what you can see in the Australian curriculum now is that history is there to tell us how we got to the situation we find ourselves in today, to understand our present. What were the roots of our present? Geography is pretty much about, well, this is the world we live in and we better look after it. How do we use it and how do we work within the world? And business, of course, is about how do we provide for ourselves to live within the world? Civics and citizenship, how do I act as a builder of community? And this curriculum can be taught in an integrated way. And this is what we want to do, to take business out of being an elective and put it into the HASS area. So human and so, what is it, social sciences? HASS. And the idea is that in year seven next year, and possibly in year eight as well, we would have our students go from a primary school context, year six context, where they connected quite strongly to one teacher and at our school access to some other teachers but effectively, a class belongs to a teacher who teaches them in all the learning areas. As they step into year seven, we'd like some specialization. But I think it is challenging for a year seven child to move straight into close interaction with a lot of people once after the other um, in a busy day. And so what we would like is that we would have, say, our three, four, however many year seven classes, let's say three for argument's sake, three or seven classes, three teachers, all programmed at the same time. At least one of them is a specialist English teacher. At least one is a specialist HAS teacher. 
and the other one teaches across both areas. Most teachers have a major and a minor. So most teachers who teach English could also teach in the Hass area or who teach Hass could probably teach in the English area. And these teachers together design a program for the children. Each teacher has their own class, but we'd like to use flexible groupings. So it may be that the model is that someone who is an expert in business leads the teaching and learning when that is the topic that is most important under discussion and is supported by the other teachers. When the topic is history, all three teachers are teaching history, but the specialist is the lead teacher. It may be then that a student could choose to work or could be sent to work with a particular group, so we have flexible groupings. It may be that a child is very quick, very good at something in particular, and there's an extension opportunity going on, and they're working with a specialist teacher for a while, and they're working with kids who are not actually in their class, but they're in their year group. So flexible groupings. The child's own teacher is still responsible for the student's progress and is your first point of contact. But we have a team of teachers working with a group of students and students can move flexibly. It may be a whole term you stay in a particular group. It may be for a unit of study of four weeks you're with a particular group. It may be just today I'd like you to go and work with so-and-so. So that students become um, able to work collaboratively, collaboratively with a number of people and they can also access different teachers. Sometimes a student connects very strongly with one teacher and not another. So you're going to have a tough year if you get the one you don't really connect with. You're going to have a great year if you happen to get the one you like. But you know in the world we have to work with everybody. And so it would be good for them to have opportunity to work with different personalities and with different teachers, with different students in different groupings. And so we're looking at flexible groupings. Our Year 7 learning space allows this very easily because we have interleading rooms. So it's very easy for students to move around in those groupings. And today I was taking a new member of staff around the school a bit and we wanted to walk into a particular office and you can't access this office without walking through the classroom. And there were students in the classroom and there was a teacher teaching the class. The teacher happened to be Mr. Coote. And this person said, oh, we can't go in there. I said, no, of course you can come in. And we just walked in, the lesson carried on, and we went to the office we wanted to go into. And I said to him, my dream is that the walls in our school become invisible, become transparent, and that you can come and visit. Come and have a look. Your kids will kill you because they're teenagers. They don't really want you there. But in theory at least, know that you're welcome that you can come in any time and see what it is that we're doing. And if you have a concern, you don't have to take my word for it, this is how it works. Come and have a look. We walk in and out of classrooms all the time. Later in the day, I walked into another space with this person, and there were two classes in there and three teachers. It was great. The class just carried on. The learning buzz was happening. We just walked through, went where we wanted to go, did what we wanted to do. I've been in and out of the learning plazas. Similar situation. Can stop, ask a student, what are you learning? How's it going? And they'll talk to you. And then they just carry on and they ignore you. So invisible walls. I'm not talking about knocking walls down. I do, do like some you know, comfort from the weather, etc. And some separation is useful. And some space to write on. And some space to display stuff but at least having flexibility about the way that we use our spaces. So Darren will work in human and social sciences and studies, and they and LERT will work very closely together delivering this collaborative curriculum, integrated curriculum for our students. We already have a situation where maths and science is handled by one head of faculty. So we've already signaled these things go together and maths and science would also be taught in the same kind of collaborative way, which means that students can move up and down, if you like, a ladder of learning 
as and when they need to. Me, I was pretty cool with algebra, so I'd move up the ladder a little and go and find a teacher who could work with me on my algebra. But when we were doing geometry, ever seen me park my car? It's at least three attempts, even when it's the same space every day. Ask Steve, he parks next to me, it's never quite straight. Sometimes I get out, I see how skewed it is, I think, ooh, I get back in and I try again. So I'd have come down the ladder and had a little extra attention and help when I was working with geometry. This is the kind of opportunity I want to give our students. So no one is marking time while others are finishing their work. Um, and, and no one is sitting there utterly overwhelmed because it's all going by me up there. We have, and you've been made aware, that we have a head of faculty for the arts, the visual and performing arts. And so Gavin Coles has moved into that, and that gives us an opportunity to expand that area and to allow it to flourish under the particular expertise of Gavin. And then sports sciences, so health and physical education and all the science that surrounds that sits with Chris still. And technologies doesn't have anybody, poor things, because technologies is something we're wanting to focus on growing and developing. And so these teachers, when it comes to the administrative stuff of checking their report spelling, people like Kerry and I, Kerry McFarlane, the back there, and I are kind of looking after these, these teachers as we are developing our technologies program. And this is an exciting space to be working in because the school is moving forward, looking at maker spaces, you know, looking at um, all kinds of ways of dealing with the digital um, technologies as well as others. And something we've also done is at the moment we're in the process of appointing a facilitator of e-learning, someone who can actually get alongside us as we design across our curriculum, not only in the technology space, and help us to embed technology in a natural way. Someone like me, digital immigrant, you know, my kids always have to remind me when my phone doesn't work, think computer, switch it on and switch it off. I forget that. Um, I, I just don't go there naturally. But our young people do, and we want our learning that we offer them to be given to them in ways that engage them fully. I really don't want the computer that I'm using in the classroom to be a very, very expensive pencil and paper. And a lot of the time, that is pretty much what it is. Yeah, it saves a bit of paper because I can send kids notes instead of handing them out on paper. But that's pretty much all I'm really comfortable doing. I want to do so much more. And so that's what we're going to be doing, is providing learning for our teachers, learning for our students, so that we can capitalize on the digital spaces. So integrated curriculum delivery I've spoken about, very much embedded in thinking about stage, not age learning. Have you ever thought about the fact that at the moment we group kids, year seven, year eight, year nine, year 10, according to their ages? And I'm wondering, whether we couldn't start thinking a little bit more about stages. Even if you think back to when they first learned to walk, when they first cut teeth, they didn't do it at the same ages, and they do it in their own time. So let's not make some kids wait for others. I was thinking the other day back to my Morgan, who loves to cook at two and at three. By the time she's 13 or 14, I'm pretty willing to bet she can deliver a meal. And what's going to happen if she comes to a school such as ours and such as many schools and you cycle through your elective and you have to go to food tech and they're going to teach you how to turn a stove on? Come on. We get kids coming in with all kinds of capacity and all kinds of passion and we would like to meet their need exactly where it is. So we're stepping towards designing learning that meets individual need and provides students with much more choice. English and Humanities, I've spoken of, Science and Maths, integrated electives. We're keeping as they were. Some of the electives will change, as in Ag Science gets pulled into the science curriculum. Um, I've already said business, civics and citizenship get pulled into the Hass curriculum. But the other electives, technologies and so on, remain as they were, and every child will cycle through them still for next year. When we've had a bit more conversation, you might be ready and willing to allow us to say, okay, if you can already cook, here's your course. You want to learn how to cook, here's your course, or whatever. 
The learning environment is important to us and we know that one of the most significant aspects of this is the social and emotional space provided for students. New learning is risky. I'm terrified out of my wits tonight, not because I'm talking to you, but because this thing is recording me. It's a new space for me, but I'm trusting the people involved that they won't go and broadcast it on Facebook the minute we leave this room, but that they'll actually have a go at editing and, and making it yeah, acceptable. Um, for our students, every time they step into new learning, they're risking. So they need to connect with us and they need to trust us. And we have changed the pastoral care system. We're building a culture of better, what, what, what did you call it, the I belong culture that enables students, our, our, our respect, sorry, oh, our, our respect. Yeah, yeah. We, we're trying not to call it behavior. Our respect. So positive behavior culture that we're wanting to build. So it's all about enabling students to have this tolerance of each other and make the learning environment a safe space rather than the mockery of each other and that type of thing. The put downs that teenagers are so clever at using as a mask so much of the time to mask their own inadequacies or own fears. Um, we're really cleaning that up from the inside out and that's what that was all about and working on that. Now, this is the big news. We're changing the timetable structure. So I wanted you to have a look at this. Now, this information will come to you in hard copy or in, uh, on the next email. I'll put all of these together so that you can have a long look at them. I don't expect you to look and know. But essentially what we're doing is moving to a 45-minute period day structure, three periods, two periods, two periods, and the way that we want to timetable, particularly for the students in 11 and 12, is five periods for your subject, so five periods per course, and that gives you a little more time in the classroom than we currently have per course, and two doubles and one single as far as we can do that, so that we will have an hour and a half, an hour and a half, and 45 minutes, as much as possible. And this is to provide those extended times for students to really tuck into work and minimise the loss of time due to packing up and moving around the school. So that's part of what lies behind that. In year seven and eight, that's the allocation of time to each subject. So now that was created when we were checking that we're meeting the requirements of the Australian Curriculum Implementation. The way we're going to do it is English and has. Is 11 periods altogether, add note, that's 12, and science and maths gets 12 as well. So we're kind of giving that area 12 and that area 12. Then foundations is the Christian education, Christian living. We're finding a new name for that, but I hope you, yeah, do you know what foundations is? That's cool. We'll talk about that in a minute. SEL, we want a new name for that. This is the social emotional learning. And we're fast coming to the conclusion didn't change it here, that we can't talk about SEL without talking about our Christian living and our Christian perspective. If I want to talk to you about how you deal with sadness and how you deal with unhappy relationships and how you deal with joy, how would I divorce that from my notion of what it is to do that as a Christian person? And so we're thinking that those two periods can have the same name and I'll explain in a moment something that is a distinctive about them. And then HP is your health and physical education, so everybody gets that, and that covers physical jerks, movement, game, as well as the nutrition and theoretical sides of HPE that are in the syllabus. And then electives, two electives, three periods each, and Kerry can give you all the details on this. They cycle through them at, is it a third of a year for each elective? So electives don't end at the end of a term, which means for reporting, they'll report once they've completed an elective. So as the teacher completes it, she, can get, she or he can get reports ready, and as a reporting period ends, you get reports on electives. So you may get more elective reporting one semester than the other, if that makes sense. Then assembly or chapel, one period. That totals our 35. Beaut. Year 9 and 10, that's how it looks. So now English and has drop back to your 10. Mathematics and science drop back to 10. Foundations is there, SEL. Two periods, probably the same thing. 
uh, same name. Electives now steps up, nine periods, three electives, because now Spanish or language becomes an elective. We're getting serious about Spanish now because we're thinking about taking it in 11 and 12, if you choose it in 9 and 10. Um, so, yep, yeah, probably what we're thinking, possibly, probably, you can hear we're planning, we're still six months out, an elective from the technologies, an elective from the arts, Spanish, if you've chosen Spanish, or something else. And part of my dream for that something else space may look something like this. What about, call it whatever we like, so I'm calling it Project X. Child designs their own project under the supervision of a mentor teacher. So if there are 20 students selecting the selective, and I'm looking after them, I'm their mentor, but one of them might be wanting to do something, I'm going to be outrageous, in quantum physics, say. And what I know about it, you can write on a postage stamp. But I do know something about learning, and I know when you're learning and when you're not. And the child will source their teacher who would speak into that program. And the teacher who speaks into that program for them, the academic expert or the knowledge expert, might not be a member of our staff. They may source someone, it may be an engineer, parent, it could be anybody. So let's let these kids start to design their own learning. It's three periods in a week. Let's see what they come up with. And we would monitor, and they would decide how they will demonstrate their learning, and we would monitor that, and we'd have to work out how exactly we're going to do that. And, and yeah, I've got a lot of questions around it, but I'm thinking, we've got six months. Maybe we could do something really exciting with that little corner of time for some of our students. It may be some students would be so uncomfortable, so it's a choice. Some students may well choose to go for some kind of enrichment of their literacy skills at whatever level. That might mean reading and writing. It might mean critical literacy. So it might mean I'm on my way to a literature type pathway, a philosophy pathway. Let me do something like that that the teacher prepares. Or let me do that as my project X. So this is what we're thinking. If we don't get there, we'll just have three electives of what we usually have. So that's something that we're wanting to do. And then 11 and 12, just for those of you who have students in 11 and 12 and go, oh, how's this going to work for them? They usually take six subjects at five periods each. That's 30. They have their foundations, SEL 1, their SSS, PPL, and Assembly Chapel, and they're down to their 35. So core skills preparation is there, everything that they usually have is there, just more learning time in the classroom that is supervised, which is what we think is quite powerful. Okay, so that's the timetable, essentially. The one thing that I haven't shown on there about the timetable is that our dream is that we would have chapel and that foundations lesson adjacent to each other, so that it is possible that we could talk to students about whatever the topic is for chapel, so kind of preload before you go in and maybe have a speaker. Or you have a speaker and you come out afterwards and debrief with students. So we, we think that could be a very powerful way of using that time. And this would involve every teacher attending chapel and every teacher teaching that lesson, being equipped to do that. And at the moment, we have, and you'll have read, we have um, David Yates working with us, uh, 0.5, I think, is it? Two, two and a half days a week. And David has already put me under pressure to get some groups together. He's starting to work with our teachers in just developing conversations around and our learning and understanding of how to present a Christian perspective on all the social emotional learning stuff, but also how to embed that more naturally and more fully into our curriculum and in fact into everything we do every day. So teachers are starting to work with him in small groups. This is for the six months so that we're ready to roll in January with something pretty special. Learning environment involves physical spaces. You know that we are very committed to the flexibility of physical space so that we can have small group, big group, lecture theatres type um, contexts or settings, 
for discussion sessions and, of course, the very important, I want a little bit of quiet space. Today, I needed a little quiet space for a couple of hours. Off I went, shut the door, do it. And so we think our students should be allowed to work in quiet spaces as well as having collaborative spaces. We're working on our virtual spaces um, through TAS, which you're familiar with, Parent Lounge and Student Cafe, but we've been working a lot this year through Office 365, and a lot of students are using OneNote, and we're looking at how we can give parents access to that. I got really jumpy about this because in OneNote, the students I'm teaching each have their own digital notebook. And as a teacher, it's fabulous. I don't have to carry all those books home. I just go home and when I feel like it, log on, have a look. Oh, not doing any homework. All oh, those notes from today weren't that flash. And I can give some feedback to the students straight away. The downside for me was, because I always think in terms of the old way, you as mum can't go into the bag and take out the book and have a little look at how they're going. But what we've seen is it is being developed that there is the possibility that you too can log into their notebook and have a look at how they're going and that would be really nice because then we can talk about that too. So one note I think is really useful. Yammer is something that hasn't taken off a lot with students yet, but it's a little bit like Facebook, but safe because it only operates within the school. And I have a little group with my year 11s and I notice they don't really use it. Today, because we have a teacher on long service leave, I'm covering a class that works off-grid, a couple of year 12s, and in conversation with me, they told me they organised their lessons off-grid and talked to each other about their work in a chat platform. I didn't ask which one, because I know I can't join in. But the next time we meet, which is tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to say to them, guys, why don't you go to Yammer so I can see too, and I'd like to be part of this because I found this a really useful tool in the past for working with students. So these are the spaces that kids use. These are the spaces we want to go into with them. So that's what we're working on at the moment. And of course, the rich and diverse co-curricular program that we're so well known for. Outside of timetable learning periods now, can use break. Break is still quite long to allow for that. Can use before school, can use after school, Maybe even the weekend, who knows. Um, these are the things we're thinking about at the moment. In June, and I'll end with this, I was at a, a forum um, from ISQ, Independent Schools Queensland, and it was entitled Limitless Possibilities. It was the, the most wonderful, uplifting day to be amongst leaders from schools from all over um, southern Queensland. And my three takeaways from the day were these that education is about developing people. It's not about the results on a test. It's about the whole person. The results on the test will happen. They'll be fine if we're focused on the whole person because that is part of that whole package. That skills development matters more than content. Please read that. Content does matter. It matters that kids know stuff but their skills development matters so much more. And so often as teachers in the past, we've been concerned with downloading information at students rather than building lifelong learners out of students. So skills matter more than content. And entrepreneurship is everything. What they were saying, the challenge they put out to schools, is if you want to measure the success of your school, stop looking at your NAPLAN results, stop looking at your OP results, have a look at your alumni, have a look at your graduates. Are they job takers or are they job makers? Let's turn our kids into job makers because that is how we're going to secure their future. We're going to pop into some questions. If you have some questions about what we've said tonight, can I ask you that if your question relates to your own child's personal situation, keep the question and come and ask me afterwards or any time. I have an office that has an outside door. You're welcome. Come in. Um, if you have questions that are general, let's deal with them now. We also have on the tables over there some sticky notes. Now, something I do with my students so that I know what they think about what we've been talking about is I ask them to take a sticky note, so you're not allowed to go, until you've put a sticky note on the door. On one side of the sticky note, 
just a question I have is, you don't have to write that part, just write the question. And on the other side, a hope I have is. That's really helpful to me because then I get a little bit of insight into what you're thinking and what you're wanting to know. Tonight was an invitation to come and talk with us about our planning, to participate in the, in the dialogue. I want to know whether you would like to do this again and how often you'd like to do it. Do you want to get together next term to see how far we've got? What are we thinking now? How's the Project X thing going? Have we backtracked on anything? Because sometimes we go, oh, that's not such a flash idea. If you would like to do that, that's something that you can indicate on the sticky notes as well. Because we really want to be in authentic partnership with you. Not just the something went wrong and now you're mad and I've got to talk you down. No, no, don't enjoy that part of it at all. I want to get to know you and I want to share with you as we build the future of learning for your young people. So do we have any questions? Do you want to take a moment? Can I do about yes. the open learning space? Yes. I know that sort of initiated when the New Year 7 mm. was opened, but mm. I've got one in Year 8, one in Year 10. It seems to be sort of Come coming on. a bit more mm. across the senior school as well mm. now. Mm. Is that yeah. good? <laughs> you don't have to. Use <laughs> the question's about open learning spaces and are we moving more and more into that direction. Is, yeah, that, is that a fair reflection? Okay. Um, the Mind Lab, try saying that fast, Mind Lab, nobody knows what I'm saying. Mind Lab is what we've named yet another kind of collaborative open space that became available in the school. It's a space where the wall was already down before either Steve or I arrived, right? It wasn't us. It's got a collapsible door. It's got a collapsible door that went in there. It's still there. So you can close it and have two rooms. But I wish you'd seen the buzz today. So approximately 50 year 10 math students in there. Their two teachers, plus the head of maths, occasionally Kerry's going to go in there. Other people are going to pop in so that the students have the opportunity to be tutored as and when they want to. The tables, there are some round tables in there with perspex on top. The kids are writing on them. They're solving their problems. They love it and there are four portable whiteboards in the room so that they can get up and do their problem solving on the whiteboards together as well. That's what that's about. It's about learning in community. Now, off that room, at the back of that room, there is a very small space. We haven't furnished it yet. I'm asking the teachers, how do you want this used? Is this going to be beanbag space? It sounds like not. What they're asking me for is one round table for a very small group who might want to work a little separately and a little quietly. There's also another small space. Or if there's actually a storeroom and it, it, it has a whiteboard in it. They like that. They're going to come and ask for perspex like they have in your office, Steve. And what they'd like is the perspex here, the whiteboard is there, a standing desk so a teacher can, oh, come with me and in you go and I'll show you quickly and you stand there and you get it and then you go back. So this becomes almost a help desk space for mathematics. So that's how the maths teachers are using that space. Other teachers will use it in different ways and the space is available to junior school students as well as senior school students. It's actually located in what is traditionally junior school space and the first question I was asked was, it's in the junior school? Question mark at the end of that. I'm going, yeah, so what? We're one school. What about the little kids? And I go, do you go to shopping centres? I do. I'm not scared of the little kids there. And I don't run them over. So I think we'll be okay. And so far we're okay. Only today, as I was coming out, I opened the door and I almost wiped out a junior school kid who was running past. She just happened to be there in that moment. My luck, after I've said I'm so careful in shopping centres and don't knock kids over. So yes, we're starting to be much more one college using all the spaces we have. No, we're not in the business of knocking down walls. We're in the business of finding the right space for learning for the right reason for the right student. And so even in the LIC, I don't know if you've been in it, and I would love to have taken you to the Mind Lab today. If it wasn't dark, we're a small group, I would have relocated the meeting. But the LIC, the Literacy and Inquiry Centre, is kind of an L-shaped room and it's got kind of huts in it. And some kids love to go in there because it's quiet and secluded and a little cave-like. 
great space, super, really works. And I've gone in there too and gone, can I help you with something? And we're quietly working away and I can see what the others are doing. No one is killing themselves yet while I'm not looking. So I think it's about using our space as well. Any other questions? Can I yeah, on that? go for it. Well, one of the, thank you for the question, because it's often a question that comes up. Mm. Um, one, of the, one of the really important things about the way we create space for mm. learning is, so you, you, you named it open space. I prefer to create it, and, and the word term we actually use is agile spaces. Mm. And the reason why they need to be agile is because the traditional classroom is eight metres by eight metres. That, that's the standard. If you want to get funding from the government, they'll fund you for an eight by eight metre space. Nobody can actually tell you where that measurement came from. But in the traditional eight by eight metre space, there is nowhere for anybody who might need to, to withdraw for a while to actually go to. Uh, there's nowhere to actually have one group working mm. collaboratively while two people want to sit over here. Because when you work out eight by eight metres at 64 square metres, sorry, I'm going to get into the back, at 64 square metres, I think that's right, um, then you've got, you've got to have a metre around the outside so you can actually walk the perimeter of the classroom, so you took all that out. It actually ends up being about 1.2 square metres per person in the classroom. So you are, you are talking about this much space. And so what we're saying as a school is we actually want to honour the fact that people relate differently, they learn differently, mm -hmm. They, they receive information differently, they process the info information differently. So how do we create it so that students can actually understand themselves as learners and know what they need at any particular time while also providing opportunity for our staff to get more personalised learning for those students? Mm. And you still work on a teacher-student ratio? Oh yes, yes, all the time, yeah. absolutely. Well, we're, we're actually, so we, we are required to really. Yeah, that's um, we're, we're pretty crazy if we said, by the way, we've got 78 kids yeah, in one teacher. One class. But what I've just said is we had 50 students in there. Now usually they'd be in two separate rooms, one teacher each, so about 25 per teacher. But we had three teachers in there, 50 kids. It's quite expensive, but it was great. <laughs> it works well. And can I just say about space too? Uh, I first worked with Steve in 2011 and it was conversations about space that led to the following kind of things happening. I walked into my class and I taught from the back of the classroom. I know that sounds like so. And the interesting thing was what it did about the sense of locations of power in a classroom and of teacher as owner of all the knowledge it, that kind of disappeared very quickly when I started working in different parts of the room. And perspective, kids' ways of looking at what they were learning changed. I was awed by all the benefits that came out of all I did was stood at the back of the room and worked from there. You know the Dead Poet Society standing on the desks thing? It was a bit like that. And what we've done in the Mind Lab is there are no, there's no teacher desk. That's a very deliberate thing. Because what we're wanting to signal to kids is it's not about me, king of my classroom, queen of my classroom, powerful. I know it all, and you better be nice to me because I grade your work. It's not about that. It's about let's learn together because we learn from our students as well. Very often I have students who will say things and I go, wow, I haven't thought about that before, or let me go and find out. It's a two-way street. Anything else? Um, yes, Mind Matters is the framework that we've been using as we've been planning and we're looking at what could, it, it's not a set of lessons, it's merely a framework, are you familiar with it? Um, it's used a lot across Australia and it, yes, no, it's it, it's a framework more than anything else. There is training for staff so that teachers can go in. It's an online learning platform for us to understand a little bit more about all of these things we now suddenly have to understand. When I started teaching in 1980, I don't think anyone even expected me to know what dyslexia was, let alone anxiety and depression and all the other concerns that young people... And as for defining bullying, well, you know, we didn't really worry too much about those things in 1980. So we've had to learn a lot about the social-emotional space, let's say. Um, and, and what we're doing is taking that really seriously at Calvary, is what we're saying to you. And, and what we're wanting to do 
is take Mind Matters, which is not an, a specifically Christian content, and put it into our context and make it Christian. Yeah. So offer it from a Christian perspective because that's what we're about. I can't see how we can do it any other way. I mean, aren't we supposed to live and breathe and in everything we do? This is who we are and this is what we do. And this is what we're modelling for our students. Yes? With the, so the year seven and eight, mm. with the mm. structure where they're a third of a grade mm. doing English subjects mm. at, the, at the moment, doing math subjects, mm. would that be the same or would they all be doing English at the one time? All at the one time because that's what gives us the flexibility. So the teachers can plan in a team, which means if I'm part of that team because I'm an English teacher, when we're wanting to do something that is very much relying on those skills, I can, if necessary, upskill the teachers and lead in that area. Um, when history might be the topic, if Steve's part of the team, he would be the leader. I think I'm smart enough to follow his instructions and to have enough understanding of how to deliver year seven or year eight history. And so we would. Because, yeah, I know a little bit about history. So the whole grade. We're trying to tame to our table for the whole grade. So yes, a lot of students, but those rooms, have, have you seen the rooms? Come down and have a look, because they're interleading rooms. There are doors, sliding doors that close, but we can open them. And in between most of those rooms, there are smaller rooms. So I'm teaching a year 11 English class in there at the moment, and often I have a little group go into another room with a specific task. I'm supervising them there and here. So we could have the doors all open, for whatever particular activity we're doing, or we could have them all closed. Some open, some closed. And there's also outside, there's beautiful outside space, both sides, and lovely weather conditions. So why do kids have to be inside? They could be outside learning as well. But always very carefully designed learning activities for students that move their learning forward. And so that's what we're working on, is skilling our teachers in terms of thinking and thinking styles. Mm. Yeah. So no, it's not a space like this, free for all, go for it kids, and oh my goodness, it went wrong. <laughs> it's very carefully designed. Yeah. Anything else that interests you? Mm. It is loud, isn't it? Um, so does that mean that they're great in classes? No, no, the, the grade seven, so if, if you have, say, 75 year seven kids, three classes, yeah, three of 25, yeah. so I'd have my class, Sue Ellen has hers, Kerry has hers, but we're all three teaching English and Hass to the classes simultaneously. So it may be today I'm working with 10 of your students, 10 of your students and some of mine, and so on. So the students would get to know all of us, but the, my 25 will always be my chickens, and I'll be responsible for them, and they'll know they belong to me. So, yeah, very, very similar, very similar to the grade six model. But the, that's different then from saying they go to Sue Ellen for maths, and to me for science, and to you for history, and to you for geography, and to you for something else, and they have to deal with all these different teachers every 45 minutes or so. Um, we, that, that's quite challenging sometimes for year seven. Mm. Oh, the maths, yes. So there's a math science team, there's an English has team, so we're into specialists. That's what's different from year six. We're starting to say, oh, I don't think even I would really like to teach year seven maths. I just don't have all that strength of depth of knowledge. And so there's the seven and eight students would be taught by a math science team, an English has team, and then they'd still have their electives teachers. Yeah. Yes, not as many, yeah. so fewer. Mm. But access to greater variety and flexibility when it comes to... There, there are, for example, um, one of the things we're starting to think about is in the history syllabus, let's take it, there are introductory, or there's some introductory kind of material you need to know about what history is and how primary and secondary sources work and so on. And then uh, teachers' schools can choose their depth study. So you could choose to do ancient Egypt, um, 
ancient Greece or ancient Rome, say. And schools make the choice about which ones we'll teach. And we're thinking in the future, wouldn't it be fabulous if we could offer all three and kids can choose? And if the kids don't choose one of them, we just don't run it. So it's sort of like when you go to uni and you get to choose the stuff you're interested in. You have to do an ancient culture, an ancient civilization. Does it matter which one? And why are we putting all those kids through the ones that we like? So if it was Mr. Coot, he'd be doing Rome. I might choose Greece. You might choose Egypt, but we're choosing for your students. What we're wanting to step towards is giving them more and more the opportunity to test their own passion and develop their own passion, follow their own interests for every child in education worth having. Some kids come to us with those little interests already there and we go, sorry mate, you like Rome? This school does Egypt. So at the moment, it is still a bit like that. We're wanting to step towards something where we can open up choices because the, the curriculum is quite flexible. There is a lot of choice in there. Mm. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, with you looking at the mm. possibilities mm. with the elective, mm. um, it seems work experience as yes. such has sort of peached out in schools these days. Ah, is really? That some, well, it's not done here, is it, work experience? It, it is. Are your tens do? Kerry? Yeah. Students to do more and a lot of our students choose, even if they, at the moment in the language we use is the OP, even if they're on an OP pathway, we still have a number of students who do a certificate, so a workplace training. Um, the list of students out mostly on Mondays, our students go out, the list is huge. This is 11s and 12s. So we do actually promote workplace learning and that kind of transition to the world of work. That's it's very that's strong. something that could possibly be looked at in, yeah. you know, it, in, in it, 9 or 10 or whatever it might be. It's very, very strong in 11 and 12 and in 10 at the moment, done through holidays and so on. We lose so much teaching time to all the also goods, as in, we have camps, we have this, we have that, we have that, and I go, when do we teach? They're all goods. How do we choose amongst all these good things? It's important to note too that the work experience really took a, it started to die a natural death mm. when it became compulsory for students to, to, to stay on in school and there wasn't mm. an option to mm. leave in year 10 uh, and, and work experience was always a term to year 10 uh, experience yeah. mm. and that started, that, that it's virtually died a death largely because what we found was one, it's really hard to get work experience placements for yeah. 90 students because School down the road is trying to do it as well, so is Shaler Park yeah. High, so, mm -hmm. so suddenly mm -hmm. there's 10,000 kids in the, in the Logan area trying to find work experience all in the same period of time. And that's why the government, when they actually extended um, to students at the end of year 12, mm -hmm. they started these workplace programs, yeah. because the workplace programs are actually, they're, they're a one or two year commitment. Um, so you need to be pretty serious about what you want to buy into for that time. Um, but as Kerry said, we like to organise ours. So if people want to go and try something, mm -hmm. they do it in the holidays. Mm -hmm. I was a year 10 student last mm -hmm. year, got sent to a panel beaters for two weeks. Um, and I spoke to him, he said, I'm never going to do that. <laughs> 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 he didn't realise I'd like to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that's part of the reason it is, why, because it, it yeah. gives them a taste. It's hard to pick subjects okay. going into year 11 and 12. Yeah. You look at uni yeah. prerequisites, yeah. but you go, oh, I don't really know what I want to do. So sometimes I think oh. a couple of weeks somewhere will give them a yes or a no answer. One of the really interesting <laughs> studies that's come out recently as well is that when I was at school, pretty much by year eight, what you were going to do. Mm -hmm. It's not like that. I have no idea. So you knew you were going to okay. leave school in year 10 and get a trade, or you were going to stay on and go to university or become a... Okay. What, what, the, what the results of this study are saying is that there's anything up to 88% of students in year 11 don't know what they want to do when they leave school. That, that's a phenomenal number. I'm not really sure... I, I, I can believe it and I think that um, once those students are through whatever kind of training they're going to embark on following passion and so on, they'll be taking up jobs that don't exist at the moment. That's the problem. You know, coming back to my dad, my dad had one employer for his entire career and he retired at 65. This is my ninth employer in my career and I think I've been fairly stable. Um, my daughter has a portfolio career 
So she can do a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of that and this is how she's going to be the creator of her own job. My problem is how well is she equipped for that because she came through, she graduated school in 2004. She came through too much of the old system and it's been a struggle for her. And when I look at her, I didn't include that story, then I look at Morgan, I'm even more determined to make it right for our kids. We just can't get this wrong. Um, I, I don't have much issue with kids not knowing what they want to do because the world's changing so fast, something's going to come out of it. So I always say, follow your passion and your interest, and when you have to make a decision, make the one you think is going to open more doors. That's the strategy we've been using for a couple of years, and it's kind of serving well. So I think that that's important. And again, it comes back to, well, don't worry so much about what you're learning. How are you learning? What are you learning about learning? What are you learning about what you enjoy learning and how you enjoy learning? Because that's probably what's going to shape the future. You know, my, my sister's kids, one was doing a maths kind of degree and the other one was at a Christian university doing film and things like that. And my sister used to get on the phone to me and go, I don't know what I'm going to do about Karen, this film thing that she's doing. And of course, Mark will get a job. He's doing maths. Well, Mark struggled to get a job. Karen walked into a bank and she's earning pots and pots of money doing all their digital media stuff. The last laugh. So th this is what's happening. Follow your passion. Whatever you're good at, you'll make a living in that. that that's, I think, what we have to say to kids. Anything else? I don't want to hold you. If, if, if anybody wants to go, please feel free to disappear and we can stay and talk here. Yes. <laughs> yes, we're talking. And we are. Yeah. Absolutely. At the moment, we have a student in year 12 who's doing Japanese through distance ed because my understanding is Japanese used to be taught here. Um, yes, we have lots of conversations around language. Language is my passion, and I think an Asian language would be wonderful. Um, we've been talking about Chinese and our dreams. Oh, we are dreaming very big. I'm just giving you the first step. Um, yes, yes, it is, it is a conversation we're having, and we would love you to tell us more about what kind of language you think we should be following, what would be the next one we'd introduce and how we would do that. There is still a very strong uptake of Spanish, so it lives. It puzzles me, because I, I come along and I go, uh, nothing against our Spanish program, I think it's a great program, but I'm going, we're Australia, we're the Spaniards, what, what's going on here? Spanish? Really? But it's great, kids are loving it, and it's, it's got good numbers. For a school our size, as alert, it's doing really well. So, no, we are not cutting Spanish. Did I say cutting Spanish? That's going to be misquoted. We are not cutting Spanish. But we would have conversations about uh, an Asian language, most certainly. Yes. 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 Another subject question. Mm. Uh, I know certain schools give their kids the opportunity to do things like Math C. Yes. See whether they can pick up Math 11 yep. and E11. Yep. So yep. You're talking about fast tracking, basically. Yes, we are talking about that. Um, there is already opportunity for students to get involved in extension, like through the STEM elective. But what we know, you'll be aware that year 11 and 12 courses are changing. In, so the kids currently in year 9 will go through the new ATAR system. And Kerry and I have been to a number of meetings where we've been told a bit about this. I've been through the implementation of 11 and 12 in WA, new courses, and I must say, I'm very impressed with the way Queensland's rolling it out. So have confidence. It, they're doing a sterling job. Um, one of the things that is on the table is students can fast track and that you can actually do some year 11 courses in year 10 and so on. So, yep, it is possible. And as that conversation develops with the new courses, we would certainly have conversations around how we can do that for our students, yes. Whether we do it, how we can do it. Nothing is off the table. We're dreaming big. Mm. 
can I, if we're talking about big dreams, can I throw the city idea? Here's an idea. You might not like it. Sorry, did you ask permission? No, no, I'm just telling you I'm doing it, but I sort of looked because I thought you could go, eat, don't. One of the things that a lot of schools do is year nine is a, is, is a difficult year for students. It's a year in which they're very often struggling so with themselves and they get a little lost. And some schools have special programs to kind of distract them, divert them, I don't know what, deal with it effectively. And one of the things I've been, th I've been thinking a little bit about, and I've come down from a term to maybe a week, maybe two weeks, could you imagine if the city became the classroom for our year nine cohort for a week, let's say, or two or three, depending. And teachers have developed a program for them. So you drop them wherever the public service transport is or here or whatever and we bus them. I haven't worked that one out yet. We get them to the city and they study urban renewal, not from a textbook, not from a virtual, but have a look at it. Have a look at what's going on in our own city. Have a look at um, things like the, the arts precinct and how that's being used and developed. Have a look at opportunities for fitness in our city. Have a look at what can workers in the city buy for lunch and how healthy is it? Who's eating where? Um, visit the museum and the art gallery and all those things that we go on excursions to and integrate that into curriculum. I'm not sure what the global inquiry question would be for this special week, etc. But my brain's buzzing away. We could be doing something really exciting for our kids um, and, and cover curriculum while we do it. Um, Madonna mm. King, who was at mm. ABC, mm. District 12 ABC, a broadcaster, has just written a book called Being 14. It's all about girls who, who are turning ah, 14. Yeah. I'm, I've only got yeah. boys, but I've yeah. it anyway. And she's saying exactly the same thing. The grade 9, 14 is, is, is the It is worst difficult, for yes. It's only in the yes. to girls. But yeah. she doesn't quite yeah. see why women with boys. And there are schools that actually do that type of work yeah. already yeah. now. But That's it. Rural type schools. And yes. Type yes. So I would support that. There's a Melbourne school that takes, their, it's a boys' school, and they take boys for an entire term, and they live self-sufficiently, no contact with parents, no digital stuff. These are the kinds of programs that are out there, and I've visited a number of schools that have done that. Something I cut from what I was going to say a lot earlier um, about the experience that Stephen and I have is we, we are committed to providing this education worth having, and we have looked at schools nationally and internationally. Um, Steve's looked at schools in Europe. I've been in schools in the States. There was a school in New York I visited where it was a school that had closed down, so the building was there, and whoever the powers that be were recruited teachers and said, you're starting from scratch. Build your dream school. Wow, it was exciting. And there's a lot of that stuff that we can do here. We're not starting from scratch, but we could step into this dream learning for students, the things that we dream of. And that's what we're wanting to do. And those are the conversations we're wanting to have. So this is the beginning. Keep talking to us and keep encouraging us to dream big. Yes? Sorry, have you ever thought about looking at um, doing immersion programs for 11 schools? Like 10 more high percent that I need to do an immersion and not to immersion. My next investment is that we covered all three. Yep, yep. So, yeah, so it, it just, um, so these children basically, they get chosen into this immersion mm, program mm. and they do it right the way through high school. Yep. And they kind of get there with that full group. Uh, that Fantastic. Idea, so, yeah. That's similar, I don't know yes. if they do it as well, but that's... Um, Nothing's off limits, wouldn't I've you just, say? I've just written that down, Kate. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I know it's you. So, so these are the things that keep me awake at night. I go, how, how can we do this better and, and how can we take you on the journey with us? That's what this is about. Yes. Because of a family that mm. their child had to leave the school in 11 or 12 because the subjects weren't offered, mm. not offered on the same line and the, yes. the career path that yeah. that person had chosen, mm. is that going to change mm. with like a small school like ours? I think, I think that's an issue in, in so many schools and it's also an issue, let's leap, into university. Um, there's a, 
I, I recently completed some studies a couple of years ago I completed and there was a course I wanted to do and it just kept clashing, never got there. And what happened? It was a course in authentic assessment. Well, I can read so, and I can learn, so I taught myself. But coming back to your question more specifically, um, we are doing everything we can to keep the variety as wide as we can. But you win some when you're a smaller school because it's an intimate community. You lose some because you don't always get all that variety. The other thing is that there is, aside from, say, mathematics, the big ones, let's say, big subjects, and we make sure that a student who wants to do chem physics and top maths will always find that combination available. Those kinds of popular combinations will always be there on lines where they can pick them, let's say. But I, I taught a girl once who couldn't get drama, which clashed. She got over it, got on with other learning, went on to university, did drama, and she's worked her entire career, she's about to turn 50, in acting and drama, picking it up at university. There are things you can learn at university that you haven't done at school. If you don't do politics and law at school, you can still take that line at university. You don't have to do psych at school to start it at university. I didn't do German at school. I did it at university. So I think when, when students start going, oh, I can't do that at university, so I need another school, maybe we need to think again about the whole package of what the school offers. And if it's just a subject choice that is the issue, maybe we just live with it and pick it up later. If it's the whole package we have the issue with, yeah, be my guest, go find a better package. But please talk to us first because we think our package is pretty cool. <laughs> and we're reshaping it all the time, improving it. So, so yeah, the, you'll never satisfy everybody. And even in 9 and 10, when you're looking at electives there, we're probably not going to satisfy everybody. No university satisfies everybody and no school actually does but we'll spend a lot of time doing everything we can to make it work. Mm. So those are the conversations. Don't look at the grid lines and go, ah, I need to find another school. Come and talk. Let's see what we can do here. Mm. Anything else? Thank you. You have your sticky note task. You're not allowed to go without a question. And I hope, if you would please, leave them on the door. And there is tea and coffee if you would like to linger. And please feel free to chat and do keep coming back and talking to us. And you haven't told me if you want to do this again, especially maybe not the presentation, just the chat time. Where am I up to? Five minutes of where I'm up to and then the chat time. I can do five minutes. My students time me. I say to them, I have to explain something to you. I think it'll take me three minutes. And I'll come their phones and then... If it pings, I have to stop. Hmm? They can write it on the sticky note. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So how would you like this to be? Uh, I'd really like to talk to you more. I'm very aware I spent the first six months just looking, working out how this works and what do we do next. And now I'm wanting to really step into getting to know you. Thank you very much. <laughs>